my soul longeth after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. for the reading of God's word. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You are running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. 
You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, it's great to be uh, here again with you at Bayside. We did get in about 1 o'clock to the hotel. At 12.45, we stopped at one of your finer establishments to uh, grab a bite to eat. There's not too many open at 12.45 in the morning. Uh, But apparently, I didn't get a fully cooked something or other. So I've been up most of the night uh, doing various uh, things. Um, And so uh, I may fall asleep up here in the pulpit, but uh, I trust I won't. Uh, The Lord has been good to us. I've got great energy. Um, Officially, I'm back to work this week, and so looking forward to teaching uh, this coming fall. I'm supposed to teach uh, two courses. I'm going to teach four because, like, I got good energy now, so might as well uh, go all the way. And uh, looking forward to um, this coming uh, fall at uh, Dallas Seminary. I want to welcome each one of you, and uh, especially the butts are here from uh, uh, Cairnport, Saskatchewan. They were students way back when I was teaching there back in the 80s, and so we are glad to have them uh, here uh, today. Sharon read a passage. Notice a few of you laughed a little bit at uh, some of the things. Might as well go all the way, emasculate yourself. Say, what's going on here in this passage? What is he talking about circumcision for? Well, what I want to do is take a look actually at the very last section, Galatians. So if you've got your Bibles, I want you to open them up to Galatians chapter 6. I didn't get Sharon to read verses 11 through 18. Uh, I got her to read those other passages because they're going to function as a background to what Paul has to say at the very end of his book. He's going to summarize what he's been saying, and he's going to challenge them. Often when you look at a passage like this, you think, well, what can we kind of get out of it? Well, I think there's a great deal to get out of this passage, and we will take a look at it. Paul, on his first missionary journey, traveled with Barnabas over to the island of Cyprus, and then he headed north up into the region that we call Galatia. Now, uh, scholars sometimes think Galatia is further north, and it actually changes the term for Galatia is both south and north. At this time, it's in the southern region, and Paul uh, went across the Mediterranean, and went to a number of places, Iconium and Lystra and Derby, and preached the gospel and got kicked out of almost every place. See, we wouldn't really put him up forward in our uh, Christian talk shows. Paul, come and tell us how you get kicked out of every place that you go and preach. But, but Paul just went there and he preached the gospel, and the people who were upset at him were the Judaizers, those who still wanted people to live as Jews. And if they had become Christians, they wanted them to go back to live as Jews. Now, Paul is writing this letter in about 48 AD. If the uh, gospel, uh, Christ crucified, buried, rose again, occurred in 33 AD, then we are just talking about a matter of uh, 15 years or so since Christ had been crucified. About three years after the gospel had begun to be preached in Jerusalem, Paul, Pharisee, uh, was confronted by the Lord on the road to Damascus, and he became a believer. And he was a full Jew. He had studied. He had gone through all of the ritual. And now his whole thinking had to change. And Paul spends three years out in Arabia, out in a desert place. He knew the scriptures, but now he knew the fulfillment of those scriptures with Jesus Christ, and he had to rethink a great deal. And he came back and he began to minister, especially among Gentiles, which is rather interesting. Being as a Jew, you would have thought that he would go to the Jewish people first. 
Peter goes to the Jews, Paul's an apostle to the Gentile, but every time he goes to a place, he always goes to the Jews first. He wants them to have the opportunity to respond, but God has also called him to the Gentiles. And what we're going to see in Galatians is that Paul would go to the Jewish people when he first arrived. They would not accept him. He would go to the Gentiles, and when the Gentiles began to respond to Paul's message, the Jews would come and kick Paul out. Once they stoned him and left him for dead outside of the city. So Paul goes in about uh, 46 uh, AD to Galatia, spends about a year, a year and a bit traveling in this area. On his way back, he establishes churches, appoints elders in each of the areas that he had been to. And then he comes back and he writes the book of Galatians. This is probably then the first book in the New Testament ever written. Um, the Gospels weren't written until 60 and 70 AD. Of course, the message of the Gospel was there because the Apostles were there and they could tell exactly what Christ had said because Christ promised them that the Spirit would remind them of the things that He had said. The Spirit would teach them. And so these Apostles are reminded of what Christ has said and done and they also now are being taught by the Spirit so that they can continue to put truth into effect in the Christian church. And so in 48, Paul is going to write to these churches. It's not a church letter like Ephesians that is written to the church at Ephesus. Uh, there's not a church at Galatia. It's a region. And so he's writing to the churches in this region. And he wants the people in this region to understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ the, the gospel is righteousness by faith in Christ alone. He wants them to understand this very, very clearly. There is no good news if you add anything to faith alone in Christ alone. And that's what they're going to be trying to do in this church. But that's how a believer is saved. It's not Christ plus good works. It's not Christ plus going to church. It's not Christ plus going through certain rituals. For the Jewish people, that ritual would include circumcision, a removal of some loose skin at the end of the male reproductive organ. The Jewish people were told to do that back at time of Abraham so that they would understand that the seed, the semen that comes out of this body is going to produce children who are part of the Abrahamic family, that they have the promises that God gave to Abraham. And so it was to designate them as Jewish people. But Christ has now come. And no longer is that necessary, but there are people who still want to make this a requirement for salvation, and if they can't make it a requirement for, requirement for salvation, they want to make it a requirement for living the Christian life, for sanctification. But Galatians will say this is how a believer is saved and then established to love uh, in, in a freedom, in the power of the Spirit, rather than keeping the law. Poor Peter it took him almost 10 years to figure out that because Christ has come, he no longer has to keep Old Testament law. He's down there at Joppa, and uh, uh, some guys show up from Cornelius' house, a day and a half journey north up in Caesarea, and uh, invite him uh, to their house. Well, well, Peter is a good Jew, does not go into Gentile homes. But before those men got there to ask him, God had let down some unclean animals, animals that, they're not dirty animals, but animals that ceremonially were not allowed to be eaten. And now he says, Peter, go ahead and eat these. <laughs> no, Lord. Isn't it interesting how we tell the Lord what he's saying maybe just isn't the right thing to, uh, to say? <laughs> and the Lord says, take, take and eat. What I've declared to be clean is no longer unclean. That is, the rules have changed now. You're no longer a part of the Jewish 
community, you are now part of the Christian church and we're no longer under the Jewish laws. But here in Galatia, there are going to be people who still feel that they should be under Jewish law and the foundation for the Jewish law is the circumcision of all boys eight years of age and if they become a Jew later on, then they need to be circumcised at that time. I doubt that many of us are tempted to insist that people get circumcised these days. If a person became a believer here at Bayside, would uh, some of you men go with them and say, man, you know, you really need to be circumcised? That's just not an issue for, for most of us. There are some physical health reasons a person may be circumcised, but it's not required by Scripture for a Christian person to be circumcised. So, so what is Paul talking about? Well, I think today what we need to understand is it's not that most of us are tempted to go to Judaism, but many of us are tempted to go to the rituals, to the rules and regulations that occur within religious uh, uh, factions, uh, religious groups that are here in our uh, country. There'd be some people who would think if you're not wearing a tie, then obviously you're not truly a Christian. You can wear a tie if you want. I'm wearing one today. It doesn't make me a Christian. It's not part of that. It, it can be part of, of our getting together singing hymns or having a drum set or doing this or doing that, these are not part of what is essential to become a believer, to live as a believer. Now, we all have our preferences. I enjoy country music. No one said amen there. <laughs> Sharon knows that country music is not biblical. Like, she just knows that. She's a trained musician, and for, for her to have to listen. So when we're in the car, uh, I don't turn on country music. When she's not there, I can do whatever I want, and I turn on country music. <laughs> you know, that, that's just a, a preference. It's not uh, uh, good or, or bad, although we always need to be careful what words we're listening to when we're listening to any type of music, because it can not necessarily be a, a biblical uh, thing. So, so we have our preferences, but these are not... Paul's not going to talk about people who have preferences who say, yes, you're, you're a Christian, you don't have to do this. I prefer to do it this way. These people are insisting on it. And so in chapter 1, we're going to just finish this book off, but chapter 1, there was the threat of perverting the gospel. Paul writes to these people and says, listen, I was just there a couple years ago, and I can't believe that you are so quickly turning aside that people have come along within the last few months and have got you thinking something different about the gospel. The gospel has to be protected. And in our world today, there are churches who are not preaching faith alone in Christ alone. They are adding to it. Because as humans, we want to have some sort of of help, some sort of part in it. It's hard for us just to accept a gift without doing something for it. Some of you at Christmas time, someone's going to come over to your house and they're going to give you a gift. And the first thing you're going to think of is, I didn't get them one, so what can I re-gift under my Christmas tree uh, for them? Because it's just hard to take a gift and say, thank you. We kind of feel like we, we need to do something, return the favor, whatever, add to it. And, and Paul says, that's a perversion of the gospel. You don't add to it. The gospel that Paul taught, he said, I received directly from the Lord. The Lord met him on the road to Damascus and gave him instruction. And he said, this I didn't get from people. I'm not looking around to find out what other people think about the gospel. I know what the Lord has said to me. In chapter 3, he goes specifically to the Mosaic law. The 613, thou shalt, thou shalt not. And it's the way the Jewish people lived. A number of Orthodox Jewish people still live this way today. 
They've updated it. They have problems. Can you program a computer on Friday to run on the Sabbath? Does that really work or not? So they're having to come up with some technological challenges of, of what is work and what isn't. But there are groups of people who are still trying to abide by these. And, and Paul says, look, it has nothing to do with salvation. See, there are Christians who think you need to be at least good enough before you can get saved. They look around and say, boy, that person is close to being saved because they're really good. <laughs> I'm thinking they may be the furthest ones away because maybe they're counting on their, their goodness to somehow feel accepted. Uh, it, it, there's nothing we can bring. Believers must understand that they are sons of God, not slaves of the law. There is a new way of living. Christ has made us free. Don't be subject again to the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to living under this law where you were a slave, rather live as sons, not as slaves, sons of God. Chapter 5, Christians can experience freedom by living in the spirit, not living in the flesh. We took a look the last time I was here at Galatians chapter 5 about being led by the Spirit and filled with the Spirit. Um, that the, the Spirit of God is the one. We no longer have 613 thou shalt, thou shalt not. What we have is the Spirit of God leading and guiding us. Say, so what about the Word of God? The Spirit of God gave the Word of God. So that is the guidance of the Spirit. You would never say the Spirit is leading you in a way that would be in opposition to what He has given to us in the Scriptures, especially the New Testament, that is, reflecting upon the finished work of Christ. Chapter 6, took a look at last time I was here. You're to do good. If anyone's caught in any transgression, you are spiritual, should restore him. Keep watching yourself. Bear one another's burdens. Bear your own burden. Do good to others. And then we come to the passage we're going to take a look at now. And finally, Paul says, listen carefully. He is going to make a personal appeal from himself. Now, he's given truth. But now there is emotion involved as well as truth. And if you were here in the first hour, we talked about the fact that you need to have truth. But truth should do something to you. It should do something in your innermost beings, way down in your kidneys, so that that, that truth has some sort of effect. And what Paul is now going to do is he said, I've given you six and a half chapters, five and a half chapters of of." material truth. Now I want to tell you, you should believe it not only because it's true, but I want you to believe it because of my experience. And he's going to come and he's going to speak about his experience. And so I've entitled this, Follow Through. Follow through on truth. <laughs> no conceding. Because if we're not careful, our world is going to come along and our world is going to say, now, if you want to be part of our society, you need to post certain things in your lunchroom. <laughs> you, you need to, to change this way here. And rather than saying, no, truth is truth, and we're going to follow through no matter what it costs us, no matter what it costs, Paul is going to now come and say that. He is going to, first of all, make an affirmation of his personal involvement in this letter. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Uh, Paul will say this three other times in uh, the New Testament. At the end of 1 Corinthians, at the end of uh, Colossians, and in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse, um, uh, I, I was going to do verse 7, verse 17, verse 17, he says this, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It's the way I write. 
Now, what we think has probably occurred is that Paul has an amanuensis, a scribe, where Paul would dictate his letter, and, and this person would be writing it down. But at the end, Paul would then take the pen and in his own handwriting, now, there have been all sorts of speculation that Paul didn't write because he had poor eyesight, because he had said, you would even pluck out your eyes for me. We're not sure if that's what it was. The large letters is because he couldn't read very well. I assume what he's doing is he's writing them in large capital letters saying, look, at this is my signature. Um, you may have a contract, it's all typed up on word processing, all printed out, but then they usually ask you, sign this, <laughs> sign it right here. Uh, have a witness so that we know that this is what you have agreed to. And Paul is saying, I'm writing these large letters, not the length of Galatians, these large letters, with my own hand. He says, I want you to understand, this comes from me directly. It's not merely from a scribe. Not sure about you, but when I was growing up, if my brothers came and told me what to do, that dad told them to tell me what to do, it was fairly easy to say no to them. If my dad showed up and told me what to do, I did it. I did it. There was authority there. Kind of secondhand authority wasn't quite as much, but Paul is saying, look, this comes from me. I'm an apostle. I was the one who came to you. I was the one who shared the gospel to you. And I'm telling you, my motives are different than these false teachers who are trying to get you to do what they want you to do. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh. They want to do works. And their works, they want to force you to be circumcised so that they can check off. We got five people this week to be circumcised. That is makes us look good. It, it makes us do good works. And not, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. You see, these Jewish people here wanted people to become Jews like them so that they would be accepted in the community. They did not want the cross, which was an offense. <laughs> they didn't want to be identified with the cross of Christ. They wanted to be identified with the law of Moses, which was relatively accepted in the Roman society. But Christianity wasn't. It was considered to be uh, an illegal, outcast religion. And so they're wanting to make sure that they're not seen as being different. He says, I'm not like these people. And in fact, I want you to understand, these people are hypocritical. Um, the reason they do this is because uh, they want to boast about their influence. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. They're explaining to these uh, young believers in Galatia, if, if you want to be accepted by God, you have to keep the law. You have to be circumcised to keep the law. Paul's saying they don't even do it themselves. So, so why are they insisting that this needs to be done? They desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. It's all about them looking good, them having influence, numbers, Praise God when God adds to the church those who are being saved. But woe to us if we go after numbers for the sake of numbers. Because if we go after numbers for the sake of numbers, we usually will begin to adjust some of the truth that we believe. Well, we want them to join our church so they don't have to believe that the Bible is inspired in all areas. They want to join the church. We don't have to get them to believe that, that Christ is truly God and that he was, um, uh, came as the God man. We don't have to, we don't have to, in order to be acceptable. And you look at some churches that are growing and you take a look and say, where's their doctrinal statement? It, it, it's pretty thin. God loves you. I have a wonderful plan for your life. Come to my church. You know, the, <laughs> it, it's, it's terrible sometimes. And even if they got a great doctrinal statement, they often don't insist on that for the people who become members. Paul says, I'll tell you what I want you to boast about. 
It's not about how many people you can get to come and live their Christian life like you're living your Christian life with rules and regulations. If you want to boast, boast in the Lord. You want to be excited about something? You want to talk about something to, to other people? But be it far from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross was an offense to these Jewish people. It, it, it's an item of glory to Paul. They, they're glorying in the flesh. Paul's glorying in Jesus Christ. And he said, because of that, because Christ died on the cross, when he says the cross of Christ, he is using that to, to signify the gospel, that Christ was, was crucified, and he was dead and buried, and he rose again. All of that is encompassed with the cross of Christ. He said, because of the cross of Christ, I'm kind of crucified to the world. I'm dead to the world and the world to me. That is, the world no longer has any um, pressure on me, any influence on me. These people are trying to get you to come along and putting pressure on you. He says, that's not the way it works. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. What is important is not that you've kept certain rules and regulations, the important thing, have you been changed? Have you been changed inwardly, outwardly? Have you been changed because of what Christ has done for you because you believed by faith in Christ alone? And so Paul says, that's what I get excited about. And that's what I think that you need to get. This is not what these false teachers are getting excited about. They're getting excited about you following them, you obeying them. I'm asking you to obey Christ to come and be his disciple. And there are blessings that are available that can be experienced by those who do live for Christ. Down in verse 16, Paul writes this. And as for all who will walk by this rule, what rule? Faith alone and Christ alone. This rule, nothing that you can add to your salvation. This rule that the Old Testament law no longer is, um, you don't, don't no longer need to be a slave to it. It no longer rules over you. You've been set free. This rule reflects all that Paul has been saying in Galatians. And so he says, and those who walk by this rule, by this teaching, by this truth, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Paul started off his letter to the Galatians, uh, writing to them, Paul an apostle, not from men, not through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Grace to you and peace from God, he starts off. And now at the end he's saying, listen, there is peace and there is mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And, and so mercy, there is no longer a punishment comes. There is peace and there's mercy. Be upon them and upon it's two different groups here. There have been some Christians who think that what he's really talking about is the church who is now named the Israel of God. But in the New Testament, Israel of God is used 65 times always of the Jewish nation. It's not used of the church. Uh, in the second century AD, some people began to say the church is a substitute for the Jewish people and that we really are um, uh, Jewish or the true Israelites. They don't use Israel of God back then. But I think what Paul is saying, I've gone to the Gentiles <laughs> and there's peace and mercy that's upon you and there's peace and mercy upon the Jewish people also who have come to faith in Christ. So as you believe in Christ and Christ alone, there is peace and there is mercy. And Paul says, now listen, I've been talking to you now for almost six chapters. 
Have you ever talked to a person and you're looking at them and you think, I'm not sure they're getting this. The uh, lights are on, but no one seems to be home inside of their brain there. I'm, I'm looking at them. I, are they going to respond? And now Paul will appeal in a very emotional way. From now on, let no one cause me trouble. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Guys, I've had enough of you. You, you people who are trying to always disagree with me, trying to say, well, some circumcision is necessary. He says, I bear in my body the marks. Stigmata is uh, the word for it. The marks of Jesus. Now, what Paul, I believe, is referring to is the marks on his body that he had because of persecution. Some of these may be from some of these very people who had taken him out and stoned him. Paul says, listen, you don't think I'm telling you the truth? I have been willing to be killed for this truth. And you can see he's been whipped and he's been stoned and he's been left dead and he's been shipwrecked. He's got marks on his body. The Catholic Church came along quite a bit later and said stigmata are the marks that will occur on a holy person's body that were placed upon the Lord. And so there are bleedings that start coming from the hands and the feet and the side, and they refer to that as the stigmata, the, the marks. I believe that there have been... Uh, I think, uh, let me just uh, get this here, um, 300, so, yeah, 321 people that the Catholic Church has said they have stigmata. <coughs> and about 65 of them have been made saints within the Catholic Church. This phenomena does not incur in the Eastern uh, Church, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church. It doesn't occur within Protestant. Protestantism, and we're not exactly sure what it is and how it occurs. There are a lot of people who believe that this is something that people actually do themselves. They don't believe it's a miracle. But Paul's not talking about, look, I can show you where the nails went into Christ's body because they're in my body. He's speaking of the marks that says, I believe this to be true, and I was willing to give my life for it. These other guys are trying to do things so that they'll be accepted. <laughs> I'm willing to do things even if it causes me my life. And because of that, he says, you can have grace. If you believe this rule, and I believe it's true, and I want to show you from my own personal experience, I'm appealing to your emotions here because I have done this for you. Greg Hatterberg has given me his kidney. We went out for coffee. He suggested he pays. <laughs> I'm saying, no, I'll be paying for you for the rest of your life there. Do you know what I mean? How much does a kidney cost? Well, I don't know. I got a bill from Baylor, $135,000 to do uh, the three kidney transplant in three days in the hospital. Praise God for insurance. That's all I can say. So, so uh, it, it costs a lot. But you know what it cost Greg? It, it cost him part of his own body. It, it cost him an act of great, great love. He was talking to his kids when he first uh, said he'd be giving me his kidney. And, and his kids said, why, Dad? Why? He said, well, you do this for family. They said, well, Dr. Bramer's not part of our family. He said, sure he is. He's my brother in Christ, and we do this for the family. And uh, greatly moved by Greg, you know, I've got an emotion there, and, and rightly so. And Paul's saying, listen, I've been willing to die. I came to you to share the gospel. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, that is, be with you, brothers. In the scripture, sometimes brother, the Greek word for brother, it means male, not female, brothers and sisters. Most times when brothers used, it means believers. It's not in, in, a, in a gender context here. 
So we, we could say, some translations have it, brothers and sisters. It's interesting, Paul never at the end of the letter addresses people as brothers, but he does this time. He wants them to understand that they are part of the family. And he wants them as part of the family of which he is part of as well to experience God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Amen. Amen. Let me suggest two applications from this passage. It's really a summary of the whole book of Galatians. So application number one, on what are you basing your relationship with God? Is it by faith alone in Christ alone? Or do you have its grace plus? Grace plus living a good Christian life will get me saved. Grace plus uh, giving in the offering. Grace plus uh, going to church four times a week. Or grace plus. Or is it grace alone in Christ alone? That's just so difficult for people, especially in North America, who we are self-made people. We contribute. We don't accept things from people. And this here is say, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Jesus, it's all about you. Have you ever done that? The gracious gift of God that delivers you from the penalty of your sin is available to you today. Most of you have been coming to Bayside for quite a while. Praise God. But just because you come to Bayside doesn't make you a true believer. So I want to ask you again this morning, have you ever, have you ever said, nothing in my hand I bring. Jesus, I'm coming to you and to you alone for my salvation. Secondly, since the Christian's commitment to Christ is based on the free gift of grace through faith, are you now exhibiting a life of walking by the Spirit, or are you still allowing legalism or the flesh to dominate your life? See, when I look at some Christians and I look at their face, I think, I'm not sure I'd want to be like them. They've got these tremendous burdens on them. It's performance related. It's about pleasing other people. And that's the reason why I do things rather than saying, Jesus, I'm yours. And by your spirit, would you just lead and guide me, fill me, use me? And as you do that, there's a joy that comes in a person's life. It's different than keeping rules or living in freedom guided by the Holy Spirit of God. Are you trying to please people? Are you trying to please a list of rules and regulations that your mother or your father or someone else put upon you? And if you could just get that done, then finally you would feel free. Finally, you would feel that you had made it. Finally, you would feel that God was pleased with you. God is pleased with you because of Christ, not what you've done. No, obviously, once we have accepted Christ, we're going to be motivated to please him, but it's completely different than needing to please him in order to be accepted. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior? Secondly, are you living in the freedom that he wants you to live in? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for truth that is in your word that the spirit applies to our lives. And I pray that this day, Father, that once again we will believe, believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, the crucified one, the one who bore our sins in his own body in the tree. Father, help us to believe in Christ and Christ alone, that amazing grace. And Father, help us to live a life that demonstrates that we're counting on Christ and Christ alone. For I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.